Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like to take better photos in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I'll send you that guide for free. Jared Pullen, Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a comparison between the Sony a7 IV and the a7 III. Now, the reason I'm making this is a lot of people who own an a7 III want to know, should they upgrade to an a7 IV, or if they're new in the game, should they go with a less expensive a7 III, or spend a little bit more money, which we'll get to the price at the end of this video, and get the newer a7 IV. So this video is to help you decide which direction you'd like to go. Now I have a real world review of the a7 III. That was a great one we did out, that's Las Vegas, right? Yeah. Oh, that was a lot of fun out in Las Vegas. And then the a7 IV being that we are on, well, not lockdown, but they haven't done an event for this, but I did do a review of this as well. So I have hands-on experience with both of these. Now let's get into the specs and help you decide which direction you wanna go. Jumping right in, let's look at the differences between between the two bodies. The a7 III always had that Sony feel where you're like, eh, I would like to see a deeper grip. It didn't feel as refined in the hands, but the a7 IV does feel much more refined. They've taken a lot of the suggestions that I've had and other photographers have had, and they've implemented it into this version of the a7 IV. So I love the feel of the a7 IV. The buttons, the layout, everything just feels much better than with the a7 III. Will you notice a huge difference? Well, the answer is, Kind of, yeah, because it's much deeper of a grip when you grab onto it. You'll also notice that the a7 IV is thicker with two Cs than the a7 III. So it's slightly thicker. They're gonna weigh about the same thing. I'll get to the weight near the end of this video. If I had to choose, I would take the a7 IV because of the feel of the body. So if you're interested in which feels better, the a7 IV absolutely feels better and it's getting two Cs. So now let's get into the specs. The a7 IV has a 33 megapixel BSI CMOS sensor that is powered by the Bion's XR processor, which is the same processing engine that you find in the $6,500 Sony A1. The a7 III has a 24.2 megapixel full frame BSI CMOS sensor that's powered by the Bion's X processor. Now, of course, it's slightly older. I love the results that I got out of this a7 III. So I understand if you have an a7 III, you might be scratching your head going, yeah, I may not need this. And the truth of the matter is the 24.2 megapixels is fantastic. That is a great amount of megapixels, being honest. The 33 is really nice as well. And of course, you're getting a newer processor, newer engine. And if you're getting something very similar to what's in the Sony A1, then that is absolutely better. So for a lot of this video, you're gonna see that of course, the A7 IV is going to be better, but that is to be expected when it's a step up from the a7 III. It's not revolutionary, it's an evolutionary step. It's a lot different than back in the day where I used to say, I don't wanna see you take a step sideways if you're growing to be a professional. A step sideways was say, you would buy a D3000 and then go buy a D3100 when that came out and not take a step up that ladder towards a more professional body. But in this day and age, these cameras are used by professionals and amateurs alike. You're gonna get great results either way you go. In terms of native ISO, the a7 IV will go from 100 to 51,200, expandable up to 204,800, and it's exactly the same in the a7 III. I think you will see a minor difference between these two. Now, the 24 megapixels is lower, so you may have cleaner, higher ISO than with the 33 megapixel, but I don't think you're gonna see much of a difference. I think they're gonna give you very similar results, and 100 ISO at base is gonna be great when you're shooting portraits or have a ton of light, and you're never gonna push it up to 51,200, in my opinion. I've never shot at that ISO. The reason is, if there's no light, 
and you need to push it up that high, it's probably not worth taking because it's just gonna look like Swiss cheese anyway. But if you're shooting at eight or 10,000 or 12,800 ISO, you're gonna get fantastic results with either of these cameras. Moving on, both of these cameras utilize the Sony E-mount. They're exactly the same, which means any lens that you have on this camera is gonna work on this camera. But what's great about the E-mount is that you have third-party lens options. You've got Tamron, you've got Sigma, and of course, you've got lenses from Sony. So there's a ton of different options you can pick up and you can save a lot of money by going third party or buying some of the older used E-mount lenses that are still quick but good. So uh, uh, for anybody that's new, I'm a big proponent of glass, 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 glass. What I mean by that is I rather see you invest in glass than spend more money on a body and end up with not as good of a lens. So the 2.8s, the 1.8s, the 1.4s, the 1.2s, that's what I'm talking about. Those lenses are going to help you get better results because you can let more light in. They tend to be made better. They tend to give you better clarity. They tend to give you better colors and tones. So that's why I always say glass, 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 glass. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you Fropac 3 in action on this photo taken with the A7 IV, starting with Fifth Element. Fifth Element looks great just with one click. Then you've got Capone, gives it a very interesting look. Then we have King Contrast. King Contrast looks nice and boomy. Mentos pulls back just a little bit. Then we've got November Rain, no vignette. That gives it a nice look. And then we have Prestige Worldwide, which also looks good. But I want to go up to Fro Pack 2 because check this out. Matte black high contrast looks pretty cool. And then we've got double stuffed Oreos with no vignette. So if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash Fro Pack 3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are on sale. Or if you want to get Fro Pack 1, 2, and 3 as the Fro Pack bundle, you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. Moving on to focusing points. The A7 IV has 759 phase detect AF points that cover 94% of the frame. It has advanced AI-based AF real-time tracking, IAF, lock-on tracking, animal AF, touchpad focusing, and touch to focus. Whereas the a7 III has a little less with 693 phase detect AF points, which was a lot back in the day when this thing came out and we're like, wow, you've got 693 points. That was a revelation. All I know is when we use this in Las Vegas, this was the camera. When it came out, I sat there and said, I don't know that there's a better, more well-rounded camera offered by anyone ever in the history of cameras. What this camera did when it came out with its speed, with its photos, with its video, it still holds up today, many years later after it came out. But when it did come out, this was that camera that changed my mind with a lot of the mirrorless technologies because this was a culmination of years of work from Sony and they succeeded tremendously. So I just wanted to get that in there and tell you that. Now the AF points cover only 93% of the frame. There's IAF, but it's slightly the older IAF. Back when this camera came out, you had to press a button to get IAF to come on. Then they upgraded that through firmware, so that's pretty cool. So you have that as well. You've got lock-on tracking, animal AF, as well as touchpad focusing. Now, both of these slightly feel a little more laggy when it comes to the autofocus tracking, but then again, I'm spoiled because I've used the A92, I've used the A7R4, and I've also used the A1, so I know what the speed is like. When I say laggy, it's like, it just feels like it's slightly a little behind when I'm shooting a hockey player, but it's a hell of a lot better than what it used to be and what we used to work with. So the lock-on tracking, the IAF, is one of the most fantastic technologies ever in camera systems. It's going to allow you to get things that you otherwise would have missed in the past. Uh, if I had to choose, of course, I'm gonna go with the newer one. It has the A1 engine in there. It's gonna be slightly better, but they both are going to be really good. How many frames in a row can you get in a burst? Well, the A7 IV is gonna give you 828 raw files if you're using the CF Express Type A card, because it has two card slots. One is a CF Express A, which is a newer, smaller card that is pretty fast, very fast actually, and it also has an SD card slot as well. The A7 III will do 40 raw files 
in a row and before you basically outrun the buffer. Now this has two card slots. You've got an SD card, which is UHS-1, and then you have another SD card, which is UHS-2. Now, if you're shooting redundant, which I always recommend, if you have two card slots, you put two cards in there, you shoot raw to both, just in case something ever happens. But the camera's going to slow down the write speed. It's gonna dumb it down to the slower card slot. So even though you have UHS-2 for one, you have a one in the other, it's going to dumb it down to the speed of the slower card. So keep that in mind. It's actually gonna happen in the a7 IV as well because you have the CF Express Type A slot and an SD card slot. So it's gonna slow it down to match the SD card. Is it gonna be an issue when you're shooting? Only if you hold your finger on the button for like, eight seconds and outrun the buffer, then yes, you might outrun it. But if you're just doing bursts here, bursts there, you're not going to outrun it at all. But we haven't done a lot of check marks today. Usually I like to give check marks in this. We're going to give a check mark to the a7 IV because you can squeeze out a lot more files in a row because of the faster card slot. Being that we just talked about the burst rate, how many frames a second do you get with the a7 IV? It's 10 frames a second with both the electronic and the mechanical shutter when you are shooting compressed raw. Now, when you go into uncompressed or lossless raw, it actually slows down to six frames per second. I noticed this when I was out in the real world shooting. I'm like, this just feels slower than 10 frames a second. And when I got it back to the factory and shot the, uh, the, uh, the timer, the, the stopwatch on the phone, I was like, I only got six frames a second. I like to shoot uncompressed raw. I want the best file possible. So if you do want to get the 10 frames a second, or if you shoot JPEG, you will shoot, you'll get 10 frames a second in JPEG and you'll get 10 frames a second in compressed raw. That's actually something I didn't like about this camera. Now the a7 III, you're getting 10 frames a second with both electronic and the mechanical shutter. And when we tested it out shooting the stopwatch, we still got 10 frames a second. The one thing I'm not sure about, which we may need to check with Sony about, and they may not even tell us, is if when you shoot at the 10 frames a second, is it actually making it a compressed RAW file automatically? We're not sure. Um, but is it a big deal in this camera? The answer is no, not really. I'm gonna end up giving a check mark to the a7 III here because you truly are getting those 10 frames a second. Well, maybe let's put that check mark on hold until we check with sony and know officially like i said both of these cameras have electronic shutters as well as mechanical shutters but where would you use the electronic shutter well if you're going to be shooting silent or you don't want to be heard you're going to switch into the electronic shutter mode but it has a much slower readout when you are shooting with the electronic shutter basically what's happening is the mechanical shutter is not coming down the electronic shutter happens and you, it's reading the entire sensor. But when it has a slow readout, you kind of get this jelloing effect and you'll notice that and it might interfere with your images. Case in point, you have a golfer who's swinging and the club is going to bend or a baseball bat or a ball. You're gonna see it warp just a little bit in your images. So in this camera, being that there's really not much of an advantage other than getting the silent shooting, I would probably just stick with the mechanical shutter. Now with other cameras, you get more frames per second with the electronic, so that might come in handy, but in this case, just remember, you might see some issues with some of those electronic shuttered images. Let me jump in here real quick and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I've been using for over 10 years and get a Squarespace website. It's simple, easy, affordable, and within 30 minutes, you can have a bunch of galleries up and running on the internet and you don't even need to know coding. So to get your 14 day free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo. If you decide that it's for you, use the code FRONOSPHOTO at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now, let's get back to the video. Now let's get to the video features starting with the a7 IV. You've got full frame 4K UHD video recording up to 30 frames per second, 10 bit 422. You've got 4K oversampled from 7K with no pixel binning if recording in 30 frames per second or below. You could do 4K 60p in Super 35, 1080p at 120 frames per second, S-Log, full HDMI port, which is nice, unlimited record time, real-time tracking autofocus, focus breathing compensation, focus map, red record box around the screen. That 
is nice that they added all those features. Now let's talk about the a7 III. You've got full frame 4K UHD video recording up to 30 frames per second at 8-bit 420. 4K oversampled from 6K, not 7K, with no pixel binning if recording at 24p, 1080p at 120 frames per second, S-Log, micro HDMI port, and there is a record limit of 2959 with this camera. The truth of the matter is, both of these cameras do a fantastic job. When this a7 III came out, I told you the video in it was spectacular. The fact that you could do what you could do and it's oversampled from 6K is nice. Oversampled from 7K is also nice. You're not gonna see too much of a difference between these, but you do have that eye tracking and the lock-on tracking. You do have a ton of firmware upgrades that they put into this that have made it better over the years, but they are pretty fairly matched across the board. So it's a slight step up. If you're an a7 III person and, and you shoot video with this, you're probably not wanting to invest in this just to get very similar video features. If that's the case, you may want to step up to like an a7 S3 if you're a video shooter. So just keep that in mind. If you have an OnlyFans account and you want to stream live or you want to do webcamming, I mean, why not? The a7 IV lets you do plug and play streaming, 4K up to 15 frames per second or 1080 up to 60 frames per second. And you can record internally at the same time. The a7 III doesn't offer that at all, but that also didn't come out when a pandemic was going on and every camera manufacturer has built in the webcamming capability. So it is nice to have that option. So we're going to give a check mark to the OnlyFans camera right here. Moving on to stabilization, the a7 IV has five axis steady shot up to five and a half stops of stabilization. There's also an optical active mode stabilization, which is going to give you a slight crop, but a really smooth stabilization. So if you're going to walk and talk or follow someone, that's going to do it, but you may get a slight crop. It's super steady when you do that. The a7 III has five axis steady shot up to five stops of stabilization stabilization. So they didn't change very much with the stabilizations. Yes, you get the five and a half stop and you get the other one with the crop mode, which is nice, but that's not a main selling point if you were looking to upgrade or jump into the new system. Either of them are going to do a pretty good job. Now moving on to the electronic viewfinder, which is super important with mirrorless cameras because it's how you see the world. It's what's presented right in front of your eye. We have a really good video that's optical versus electronic viewfinder where we explain it and prove it and show it. So let's talk about the a7 IV. It has a 3.68 million dot EVF with a 120 frames per second refresh rate. Uh, that's 1.6 times more resolution than the a7 III. The a7 III has a 2.4 million dot EVF with 60 frames per second refresh rate. You are going to see a difference between these EVFs. This one, I mean, it's nice to be able to have an EVF because when I first switched over to testing this out, I was coming from a DSLR world. So it's not as clear, of course, as optical. And you would see more lines, like if you were looking at a tree, it would kind of, you know, fuzz out a little bit because it would just look like static a little bit, but you get used to it. But when you start to graduate to something that's much newer, you're like, ah, that's much cleaner. And the 120 frames per second refresh rate, it's going to be a little better. Now, if you're someone who has never used an electronic viewfinder, these aren't your grandmother's electronic viewfinders. They don't flicker anymore. They don't cause you to feel like you're gonna throw up or get a seizure you really won't know much of a difference between an optical viewfinder and electronic viewfinder. It's just that I like the electronic viewfinder because everything's right in front of my face. I know my exposure, it's all right there. I have all the information. And when you're shooting video, you can put your eye right up to the viewfinder. So we're going with a check mark on the a7 IV as expected for a better, newer electronic viewfinder. Moving on to the screens on the back of the cameras, the a7 IV has a three inch 1.03 million dot vary angle touch screen. You do have full touch screen functionality, which is very nice because in the older, menu system, you didn't have the ability to go through and touch the menu. You had to scroll through or hit the arrows. The a7 III has a three inch 922,000 dot tilting touch screen. The touch screen capabilities are limited to just touch focusing. The screen on this is not very good. It, it's, it's functional, it works. It's not the greatest. It's also attached to the back of the camera. The screen on this one, not much better in resolution. If there's one part, one place that Sony falls short, for whatever reason, they make a lot of panels. They make TVs for God's sake, but they don't put great screens on this. The difference is this has a tilting, rotatable, very angled touchscreen, which is 
good if you want to put it off to the side. It's going to be better for video shooting. It's going to be better for holding above your head or holding it down low. So we're going to give a slight check mark just for the fact that it gives you that extra option of tilting out and rotating. There are a couple of differences between these bodies as I talked about earlier. One of the things that stands out is that you have a digital hot shoe option here with the a7 IV. You do not have the digital hot shoe on the a7 III. What that means is that the a7 IV will take some of Sony's new accessories like a microphone that doesn't need to be plugged into the side because it's talking digitally through the hot shoe. And on this one, you would have to go ahead and plug it into the side when you're recording video. Now you also have better heat dissipation when you are shooting video with the a7 IV, but we've never really run into overheating issues with the a7 III. A couple of other differences you'll find inside of the camera is that you have the newer menu system for the a7 IV, and you have the older menu system with the a7 III. A lot of people complained about the menu systems. I don't really care. You learn the menu systems, and you figure out the quirks and features, and then you know where things are. It's actually a little harder for me going from using the old menu system to discovering the new one, because I don't even like the new one to be honest with you i'm not a fan of the menu system because you have to learn something new but the more you use it the easier it gets so that is not a big deal another feature that this camera has that the a1 has is a variable shutter option so let's say that you are shooting a, a concert and there's a lot of flickering light and you want to dial in something that's like 1 852.3 of a second instead of one eight hundredth of a second. You can actually do these tweener areas, which corresponds better with the lights, the LED lights that are flickering. You may be able to match it so that you do not get the flickering. For example, if you were shooting a TV screen back in the day, those cathode rayode tubes or whatever the hell they're called, you would see a lot of flickering. Well, you could actually time your shutter with the variable shutter speed option to only shoot when that flickering isn't happening. So it will, it will line up. So that's a nice feature that it has. Let me jump in here real quick and say, if you'd like to purchase the a7 IV new or the a7 III used or maybe new, check out allenscamera.com because they have Sony, Canon, Nikon, anything you can think of. They are a mom and pop store that's been around since 1977. That's where I shop for all of my gear. And if you go there, let them know that the Fro sent you. So head on over to allenscamera.com slash Fro to use my affiliate link. If weight is a concern to you, it really shouldn't be because these cameras are pretty light. This one, the a7 IV, weighs in at 1.45 pounds or 658 grams. And the a7 III weighs in at 1.43 pounds or 650 grams. So not much of a difference there. Now, both of these cameras do have the option to add a vertical grip, which will, which will then give you the ability to have two batteries inside. Now, it's not the same grip for the a7 III. So what I mean by that is the a7 III's grip will not work on the a7 IV, and the a7 IV grip will not work on the a7 III. But the a7 IV grip will work on the A92, the A7R4, the A1. It's pretty cool that the grip works across the board. That's in the $350 range if you want to get those grips. I personally recommend shooting with a grip. It's going to come in handy when shooting vertical. It's going to put all the dials right where you need it to be, but it is an extra expense. Speaking of expense, let's talk about the price of the camera. The A7 IV comes in at $2,498. When the A7 III came out, it came out at $1,998 and it's still priced there today. This camera was an amazingly priced camera at under $2,000. It's still priced well today. This one, you see the differences. So is it worth the 2,400, the, the 500 extra dollars? That's for you to decide. If I was starting new today and picking between these two cameras, I'm absolutely going with the a7 IV because I may be able to spend the extra $500. Or if you're gonna be looking to be a more professional end of it and make money, you're gonna make that extra $500 back. But I'm not sure that I would buy an a7 III new and drop $2,000. Now, if you're trying to save money, find this bad boy used for under a thousand, well, maybe around a thousand bucks. There's gonna be a lot of these for sale. If you can find a good one used, then take the extra money that you save and invest in glass. Glass, 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 glass. Glass is still super important throughout photography. So if you, if you can't justify spending that extra 500 bucks, then find this used. I, I just have a hard time buying yesterday's technology new for full price. But if you do buy it for two grand, 
You could take that 500 bucks, put it into some Tamron or Sigma lenses, buy those used, get a good clean version of them, and you'd be good to go. Which would you go with if you were starting out today? Let me know down below. If you already own the a7 III, do you need the a7 IV? I mean, that's a lot of money to spend, especially if you don't already have good glass. If you haven't invested in good glass, keep your a7 III, it's awesome. Get good glass for it. Or find someone who wants to buy it and then roll the money into this if you already have good glass. So it is a nice step up. It's not revolutionary, like I said, it's evolutionary. They both are fantastic cameras. So either way you go, you can't go wrong, but get good glass. So thank you very much for watching. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.